Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be putting my keynote hat on, so I'm going to be up here a little bit longer. I was going to introduce myself, but I thought that would be a little bit weird. When I have the hologram here, I think it'll be a little bit different. Uh, I don't know how much you know about me, but I've been in augmented reality for about 10 years. I started way back in publishing uh, in the magazine world, actually, trying to bridge the gap between digital and print. Uh, and then for the past five years, I have been uh, devoting my entire life to wearable technology, including augmented reality and virtual reality. And what gets me out of bed about wearable technology in particular is in my understanding of how it's going to change humanity completely. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our utopic and dystopic AR futures and have a little bit of fun here. So for me, uh, humanity and technology is one and the same, and that's because we've been using technology or tools to evolve ourselves as humans, and we wouldn't be the people that we are here in the room today without those tools, without technology. And of course, uh, that technology back in the day were daggers, fire, you know, clothing, and we've graduated to more advanced tools like smartphones, tablets, um, you know, uh, AR, VR devices, and all of these tools, uh, we have to make a decision to either use them for good or use them for evil. It's not the tool's fault, it's the user and the decisions that they make that, uh, that elicit uh, whether it's a, a bad action or a good action. And for this reason, I wanted to talk about how um, AR and VR uh, and these new tool sets could realize our dreams of reaching utopia or plunge us into a nightmarish hell, essentially. And because uh, oftentimes our minds want to go right to the gutter, I thought I'd start off with some positive use cases first and, and help you understand how AR and VR can really help us become a better society. And as Augmented World Expo USA 2017 is all about superpowers to change the world, I thought that this uh, talk would be really appropriate. Now, as you know, VR has been labeled the ultimate empathy machine, and that's because it literally allows for us to be another person. In fact, Barcelos Barcelona's Be Another Lab, which is being depicted here, allows you to switch genders. You actually are able to look down at your body, and if you're a man, you're a woman, and vice versa. But VR allows for you to not just switch gender, but also race, sexuality, as well as even switch species in, in general. And this is really going to cause us to challenge our traditional notions of humanity. And I think it's going to be a critical component in unraveling the stereotypes and the labels and stories that we've been telling ourselves all along about who we are and how we define ourselves. Uh, but you know, when you are in Syria, in a Syrian refugee camp, as in the case of Within's Cloud Over Sidra, how can you not leave that experience with much more compassion and empathy for that community? VR, um, as an empathy machine, really could be that missing component that could bring us all together in ways that we've never been able to do before with traditional digital media. But it's not just inner work that will take us to that utopic endpoint via AR and VR, but also how these devices, these wearable devices, will also transform our abilities to give us superhuman capabilities. And we are at the dawn of seeing ourselves become superhuman, superpower to the people is not just a slogan for an event, it's actually a mission, it's actually a statement of where we are in our technological journey. And there are many really great examples of this happening already. David Eagleman, who's a, a fantastic neuroscientist, has created a sensory vest that translates voice uh, language into haptic feedback to allow for the, the, the deaf to hear. ODG and uh, Toronto's eSight are creating smart glasses that help the nearly blind see. Rewalk and Exobionics are creating wearable robotics or, or exoskeletons to allow for the paraplegic to get out of their wheelchairs and actually walk. And these technologies right now are creating this superhuman class specifically for people with disability, but it's only a matter of time before all of us want to hop into a Best Buy down the street to upgrade our parts, maybe a different store, I'm not quite sure, but could possibly be Best Buy, 
uh, and because we want to walk faster or we want to see better or we want to see more. Uh, and so uh, gone will be the days where we're limited by the abilities that we're born with. Um, the only limitation will be whatever's in our pocket um, in terms of how much we can spend. AR and VR technologies will also allow for us to uh, learn new skills. And like Neo plugging into the matrix, uh, right now we're already seeing VR be used as highly immersive training simulations like in football with Strive VR that is depicted here, or um, with discrimination and sexual harassment situations which Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab is using. And while VR can plop us into a, sim a simulated environment that might be really dangerous, which is really critical for folks in the military or police or firefighters, um, AR can actually turn an amateur uh, worker into a professional worker simply by putting on a pair of smart glasses, such as the case of Scope AR's remote assistance uh, platform. Um, in this way, AR and VR really um, allow for us to continue what we've started with the internet to create limitless possibilities in our capabilities and our skills as people. And this is going to be key to future generations. Uh, but this, this information that we have accessible is not just going to be useful for our work life, but also in our personal life as well. Um, having knowledge about the world around you as part of your eyesight to give you context is going to heighten and improve every interaction that you make in the real world. And so take for this example that you've met somebody for the very first time, or maybe you've seen them once before at another conference, maybe AWE last year, and you can't seem to remember who they are. With a pair of smart glasses, you'll be presented with information that will allow for you to be able to break the ice. And how many of you have not talked to somebody because you just don't know where to start? Kind of like double dutch and getting into that conversation. Smart glasses and augmented reality are going to be able to provide for that, which means that we are going to be able to have much deeper connections, much deeper relationships a lot quicker than ever before. And we also can, from a business perspective, be able to make networking a lot more efficient than we have in the past. In the future, AERO will provide us with a universal memory, um, removing this notion of strangers in order to make personal connections at a very rapid pace. But it's not just providing us information about each other, like um, you know, if we like cats or I like pizza and red wine, but also how we feel. And I think this is really critical, uh, also extending that notion of us as an empathic society. Uh, this is an example of a uh, mood sweater from a San Francisco company called Sensory. Uh, it uses GSR, which are sensors that you can wear on your palm of your hands. They're the same sensors you find in the lie detector test that light up LEDs in the cowl of the sweater according to how you feel. How does this change how we interact with one another? How does this change how we understand ourselves and the emotions that we're feeling in this moment? I see a time where if we are wearing our hearts literally on our sleeves, it will hold us much more accountable to our actions with one another. How can you continue to yell at someone? How can you continue to talk to someone in a certain manner if you're literally seeing concrete scientific data on how you're making them feel? It really changes your relationship with that person. But it's not just all seriousness when it comes to AR, of course. Uh, with AR and VR, it's really uh, catering to our innate storytelling uh, needs, our uh, need to personalize our space, and it's already happening with Snapchat and Facebook and Snow with stickers, world lenses, and filters. And, um, and soon we'll be able to walk around in the real world, and if it's raining in real life, it doesn't matter. We can make it look like it is uh, sunny. Or if you don't like the lights in this conference center and you want to make them green and, and uh, orange, you can do it with a click of the button. AR is going to give us the power to make this real world less shitty and bring us into the virtual environment with VR so we can wipe this world away and actually live in a utopia unscathed by what's happening in the real world around us. And of course, as social creatures, we crave connection. And as you know, there's a continued debate as to whether or not this little computer that you're holding around in your hand is actually making you 
um, uh, feel closer to people or feel even further removed. And this conversation is going to continue even stronger within AR and VR. But for the sake of utopia, we saw with Facebook Spaces, for example, that VR could actually remove borders, where I could be in China and, uh, and my friend could be in, uh, in the United States, and we could actually not just talk on, on chat or on Messenger, but actually feel as if we're in the same space. And with Microsoft and Meta showing the same thing happening with holograms, AAR would be able to facilitate this same interaction, where I could literally be in Toronto and be on stage and you here in Santa Clara. But it's not just removing geography that AR and VR has the capability of doing, but also time as well. Death may no longer be a thing in the future. And with AI and virtual humans, like from companies such as Quantum Capture, which you'll see in the playground tomorrow, um, we may very well be able to speak to grandma forever or be able to make friends with uh, pop stars and scientists that are long gone as long as their emotional intelligence or mental intelligence are uploaded to the cloud and a 3D asset is available for them. But what I find most interesting is how this shift from 2D computing to 3D computing may actually cause us to jump from 3D to 4D from a spiritual enlightenment perspective. And if you're following anything that's happening in the spiritual world, there's a lot of talk about the ascension, and I find it um, kind of interesting that they're talking about a shift at the same time as us in technology are also talking about a shift. As we spend more time in other realities, as we play God in creating and editing our worlds, as we move away from our um, our, our sense of importance on the material world because we're living in a world that is a mixed reality that's half real and vaporware, how does this not change how we feel about this real world? How do we not leave VR and AR and come back here and ask ourselves, what's real? Is this a simulation? And how does this change our relationship with God? As we strip away the layers of our identity, ability, skills, mental and emotional capacity, and even mortality, how does this not change our relationship with spirituality? I think we are definitely going to see a link there, and I look forward to hearing Jason Silva's keynote tomorrow, which I'm sure he'll touch on a little bit of this. Okay, excited about the future? Because I'm going to rip you down. I'm going to tear you down, and we're going to go to dystopia, and that's how we're going to end it, just like that alarm. So just as we saw how Facebook Spaces, Alt Space, High Fidelity, um, could allow for us to be in the same room together. At the same time, just like in mobile, there's an argument that maybe we will end up being more alone than we ever have before from a physical content, co contact perspective. And this really comes down to how you define a human interaction, a human relationship. And I think we're going to have a lot of questions around this. Tomorrow, when you go into the expo hall, take a look at the people that are in VR and ask yourselves, what do they look like from the outside world? They're probably smiling, but they look alone, because they are. They're not alone in VR, but they're alone here in the, in the real world. Um, and so what does that mean? Does that mean that we are going to live in a very isolated, um, non-real interaction future? I don't know. Also, as AR and VR allows us to be anyone or anything, um, where does this leave truth and integrity in who we are? We're already seeing trolls and, and harassment issues within VR because people are able to hide behind avatars. As we begin to be able to pretend and be other identities, um, uh, how does this impact uh, how we relate to one another from a truth perspective? And will the future of virtual reality and augmented reality be one never-ending Instagram feed of cheerful coffee, coffees and, and uh, pugs uh, when really when we're at home and we're, we're all tired and sad and angry and scared. Saying wrap up. I'm going to wrap up. Don't worry. Uh, can you put my notes back up, though? Thank you. Uh, and so if you're a fan of Black Mirror, which inspired this talk, obviously, and I am a big fan of Black Mirror, and if you haven't watched it, then feel free to leave this keynote and go and watch it because it's that good. It's on Netflix. Uh, but this whole idea of walking in someone else's shoes and uh, VR is an empathy machine and AR making us all friends is, is a great utopic end. But these tools can just as easily strengthen and create new filter bubbles, new echo chambers, and facilitate discri discrimination and hate. 
And so in Black Mirror, these images here are of the Christmas special with John Hamm, where he is wearing a pair of smart uh, contact lenses and can edit people out uh, of his life, friends, coworkers, but also races, sexuality. You can, you can draw your conclusions there. And, um, and at the same time, just as, just as we're using Snapchat to put funny dog faces and rainbows in the, the, the real world, we can just as easily change hair color, eye color, skin color, uh, gender. Uh, we can make this world look the way that we want it to look, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, just like in training and how it can help us to, uh, to train to save lives in the case of firefighters, I'm concerned of the number of violent games in virtual reality that may be conditioning a whole new uh, generation to be more violent. Already the American Psychological Association has, has observed some correlation between violent games and violent behavior. You know, when I'm in Oculus and I play the climb, I leave literally looking at a mountain saying, I can do that. So I'm a little bit worried about us picking up a gun and, uh, and playing around in virtual reality, and then as it becomes more and more real, coming back to this reality and saying, uh, you know, is this the simulation? Was that the simulation? And something happens. But also imagine possibly a Pokemon Go or a Grand Theft Auto Go game, um, which could also facilitate, you know, very similar outcomes. We have to be very, very careful with the content that we create with these new realities. And while AR and VR uh, could turn workers into pros, give us superhuman capabilities, and so on, it really comes down to access. And I kind of alluded to this in my utopic um, examples. But at the end of the day, all of the amazing things that I talked about in the utopic um, scenario really comes down to whether or not you can afford it or not. And that's a scary thing. Uh, and, and so if you've ever seen the movie Elysium, this is kind of what that was about with Matt Damon. It was a good film. And, uh, and so at the end of the day, um, we have to really be wary about the economic models behind these technologies. And it's not just access to the devices, but also access to the metaverse or access to, the, to information. And if you read Ready Player One and, and you're familiar with the Oasis, you already saw that there were models where there were public worlds and, more, uh, and worlds that you had to pay to get to. Uh, and so what does that mean? And, and, and how is that all gonna propagate um, in, in our near future? Finally, my last slide, I'm wrapping up, is as AR and VR unravels the layers of humanity and it gets us closer and closer to feeling like God, to getting us to that God mode where we can create, we can destroy with just a push of the button, and as potentially we start to see this dystopic future come together, how does this not perhaps leave us with a sense of meaning, meaningless and a, a devoid of purpose and perhaps um, understanding that maybe there is no God, and that's the opposite of the spiritual enlightenment. So I leave you with this, especially because all of you have such a powerful role in this future that we're shaping together. Just like any tool, we have a choice for it to be used for good or for evil. And so as you're creating your games, as you're creating your software development kits, every single person here who is purchasing, using, and creating an augmented reality, we have a very very uh, serious responsibility to how we are shaping the citizens of tomorrow. Thank you very much.